order members order it's time for questions the minister of education and we will first start with our questions and I call Sean Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of the temporary flexibility uh, is to address a shortage of preschool places in an area and therefore help meet the programme for government commitment. It is not intended to be used to meet parental preferences for a particular setting. The Education Library Board Preschool Education Advisory Groups are responsible for managing requests for temporary flexibility. Based on their knowledge of demand and alternative provision in each area, they can make a recommendation to DE on whether temporary flexibility would provide increased capacity to help address a shortage of preschool places within an area. At the conclusion of stage two of the preschool admissions process, the Southern Board uh, Pre-Education Advisory Group has considered the need for temporary flexibility in all Saints Nursery Unit and recommended the approval of two additional places. The department has approved this and the school has been informed. Um, could I thank the Minister for his, for his answer and could I th uh, the parents would be very, very glad to hear this. Um, I'm just wondering in future, Minister, uh, can that process be expedited so that we don't have such stressful situations? Um, we have continually reviewed our operation of preschool placements over this last number of years and indeed since uh, uh, the review was carried out in my department just after I came into office in relation to preschool education. Where there is areas where we can improve that, I, I am all for that. I accept this can be a very stressful time for parents, but we are placing somewhere in the region of 23,500 children at this stage, so there is quite a considerable piece of work on administration being carried out during a very tight time frame. But certainly, we are continuously trying to improve uh, the administration of the preschool programme. Alec Edward. Mr. Edward. A question to Mr. Speaker. Uh, legislation places specific responsibility on parents and on the five education and library boards in the area of the education of children other than at school. This includes, this includes those who are educated at home. The boards have directly prepared guidance which reflects the existing legislative requirements and they are currently consulting on this guidance. I consider that the consultation process provides an, an important opportunity for views and ideas to be provided to the boards on how they best strike the balance between ensuring the rights and needs of children concerned and appropriately protected and facilitating parental preference for home education. As Minister for Education, my focus is on ensuring the needs of children and young people are met. Therefore, I have indicated that I expect the boards to ensure engagement with as wide a range of stakeholders as possible, including young people and their families as part of that consultation, and to ensure also that feedback they receive is considered very carefully in reviewing the draft guidance. I have also made clear that I will wish to review their guidance once it has been subject to consultation and reviewed and refined in response to that engagement once it has taken place. Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, could I thank the Minister for his answer, in which he stressed that there was a legal requirement, a legal requirement to do what he is proposing. Uh, can you confirm that that is your view, that under the 86 order there is a legal requirement, and thereafter explain why it is that your predecessor said in answer to a question that there was no legal requirement by home educators to register with the library boards? And in any case, are you not going too far in terms of the requirements that you're laying down to register children, inspect homes, approve curriculum, etc., uh, which goes far beyond what happens in England and in other jurisdictions? <coughs> well, with respect to the member, it's clear you did not listen to my response. I am not proposing anything. The Education and Library Boards are currently in a consultation process in regards to the issuing of guidance of best practice in relation to home school education. Now, within that there are balances of rights. There's the balances of the parent, the parental home, there's the balances of the right of the child to receive a good education. There's also the legal requirement upon the education and levy boards and indeed my department to ensure that children have access to education as well. So all those things are being currently consult consulted upon. I'm not consulting on anything. My department's not consulting on any modern in this regard. However, I have made it clear to the library boards that I want this to be an open, transparent consultation process for everyone to be able to make their views known. And I expect their renewed gains to be presented to me before any final sign-off upon it. 
Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I just ask the Minister, if, if this process was an, not initiated by him, by whom was it initiated, given the fact that there is a regional strategy unit which his department, I understand, sits on along with the Education Library Board? So we would like to have clarity as to where this came from, following on from the points made by Mr. Atwood. But will the Minister give an assurance that this is not an attempt by some to ensure that those, particularly from an evangelical Christian perspective, who take a personal view of ensuring that their children are educated at home in an environment which is conducive and helpful and needful for their children, that this will not be used in any way to narrow or to register them and makes it more difficult for them to be able to do what they've always done in a way which is honourable and in a way which is within the law. Uh, I, I understand the process came about after legal advice to, I believe, the North Eastern Education Library Board, who then went out to, uh, and proposed that there would be uh, consultation on guidance. The other boards, who are seeking to work now in, in greater cooperation with each other, uh, also believe that it was the right time to go out on to consultation in reg regards to this matter. As I said in, in response to Mr Atwood, there's clearly a balance of legal rights here and the rights of individuals uh, within the debate and the discussions. But I would urge members uh, not to simply follow those who shout the loudest within regards to this debate. At the very heart of this consultation process is the, the children's right to education, whether that be in the home or whether it be in school. That's what's at the very centre of this. And I can assure the member opposite that I am not aware of any agenda to stymie the rights of anyone, including evangelical Christians, not to educate their children at home, if that is their wish. My understanding of this process, and before I would sign off on any guidance at the end of this consultation or approve any guidance, is to ensure that the rights and entitlements of children to uh, education are being upheld and that the rights of all others involved are being upheld. In relation, uh, and Mr Atwood suggests in his questions that the boards have overstepped their mark in relation to the education order. I will satisfy myself of that as well before any final uh, guidance is issued in regards to this matter as well. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you will be aware that I raised this issue with you recently, and you know that this has raised anger amongst the parents who choose to educate their children at home, especially in relation to um, entering their homes. Can I ask then, when will the Assembly and the Committee be given the opportunity to debate and shape the future of elective home education? Uh, it's a matter for the Assembly Business Committee uh, to decide what. Uh, Topics are debated in the Assembly, and it's a matter for the Education Committee as to what matters are discussed at the Education Committee. I have no say in either. The Minister is anxious to uh, point out that the guidance he says is not his, but does he accept that the guidance which has been issued for consultation does gold plate what Section 13 of the Order requires? Surely even he can see that. Um, no, I do not accept it, nor do I deny it. And there would not be much point in having a consultation process by the Education Library Board if I, as, as Minister, was to stand here in the middle of the consultation process and say, well, this is how things are. The consultation process is ongoing. Members of the House are perfectly entitled to respond. To it. Uh, political parties are perfectly entitled to respond. To it. Individuals are perfectly entitled to respond. To it. And when it arrives at my desk, I will satisfy myself of all the questions that have been raised here today and other questions I am aware of. And I will also seek uh, legal advice in relation as to whether the boards have gold-plated uh, Section 13 of the Order or, as Mr Atwood would suggest, they have overstepped um, Section 13 of the 86 Order. All those things will be satisfied before any final decisions are made. Ian Millen. Mr Millen. Question over, over three. Question number three. Let the whole. Uh, I believe, Mr. Speaker, questions three and ten are, are, are together. Uh, with your permission, I will answer questions three and ten together. I have noted the court's judgment. Some of the recent press coverage, in my opinion, is ill-informed. I will decide what action, if any, is required after I receive the detailed assessment by senior counsel of the judge's decision and its implications for the work of my department. I will give careful consideration to that assessment when I receive it. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can the Minister also give us an update on the shared education campus uh, program at the home? In relation to the shared education campus, um, moving that forward, we have received uh, 15 or 16 uh, expressions of interest in relation, in relation to shared education campuses, which is part of uh, the TBOC scheme, uh, which was launched by the executive uh, earlier in the year or, or late last year. I, um, my department is currently working through those expressions of interest, matching them against the terms of reference, and I hope to be in a position uh, before the summer recess to make an announcement on those projects that are successful in moving forward. Lord Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister answering Mr. Atwood, he talked about a balance of rights. Yet in a statement on the 29th of February, he said, until I ensure that those schools that wish to move into the Liston Alley site are completed, I do not envisage moving forward with any other capital project in OMA. Judge Tracy then said, this would mean that any development proposal requiring capital punishment investment by any school not allied to the Liston Alley project would be refused without proper consideration. Does the Minister accept that, in fact, if he was to proceed down this road, then there is a big degree of discrimination? Well, uh, with respect to all assembled, and the judgment has been made, but however, there are still legal papers from the judgment to be issued by the court. There is still a full analysis of the judgment to be carried out by my own senior counsel, and I have no doubt that the, the party to uh, the case is also having their senior counsel looking at it as well. So let's not all set ourselves up. I know there's a number of barristers in the room and a number of legal professionals in the room, but let's not all set ourselves up as legal professionals uh, in, in, in regards to these matters. Or let's not all pull lines out of the judgment which suits our argument, because I could pull lines out of the judgment which suits my argument as well. So there is. So uh, th 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 that's not the way forward for this case. I believe that my decisions around area planning in OMA were correct. I believe that the Nissan Alley project, which is a programme for government uh, commitment, is the correct way forward. However, Judge Tracy has asked several questions which require to be answered, and I will answer them in due course. Danny Kenahan, Mr. Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers so far, and I guess we'll hear more of an answer later in the debate. But does the Minister agree that there does need to be a fundamental rethink on the area planning process, but especially in light of the court judgment, when you look at the agreed overall vision for shared education and you see that some sectors, if we were to paraphrase George Orwell, are equal, but others are more equal than others? Does he agree that that is the case? Well, perhaps, and, and we'll have a chance to respond to the debate following question time, uh, but in your opening remarks, you yourself said that the judge's judgment was not clear. Now, you used a phrase, and I hope Hansard's available before I respond, but, but you, you yourself are on record as saying it's not clear. So I think it's wise that we wait on judgment or on senior counsel's advice in relation to that matter. But I also, th this throwing out of some are treated more equally than others. Which sector is being treated more equally than others? Name the sector, name the school where I have acted inappropriately, name where I have been involved in discrimination against the school. Name them, because these broad stroke statements do not stack up. I can tell you of one case where I have acted differently, where I have acted in contrary to the advice that was given to me, where I have acted differently to the statistics and the figures that told me to do something different. Yes, one. Uh, in relation to schooling in East Belfast, I could have closed. Um, the, uh, the name slips my mind at the moment. Huh? Dundonald, sorry, apologies. Uh, I could have closed Dundonald and I could have defended it in any court in the land. I made a different decision around Dundonald. So if I'm accused of treating one sector differently, here's where I've treated them differently. I've treated the controlled sector differently in a positive way because I believe that inter intervention was correct. Now, if any member in the chamber wishes to present either in this chamber or outside the chamber where I have treated another school in a discriminatory manner, name it. Mr. Byrne. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers. Would the Minister accept that this judgment has caused some anxiety to parents of all secondary pupils in the Omeria? 
And what reassurance can the Minister give that the parents of children at Drumrah College, as well as parents at other schools that are seeking to have area the area-based planning process working, when do you think can, can this be delivered upon in order to end the uncertainty? There, uh, the members on the ground, you know, I, I wonder how many parents in the street have stopped them in relation to the re recent court ruling around Drumrah. And the member, I, I hesitate a few, if any, because I don't believe this ever needed to end up in court in the first place. I already had indicated that I would review and retake the decision in relation to the expansion of numbers in Drumrah Integrated College before this ended up in court. Now, the scenario what the member wants to, maybe wants to explore is this. What if I had have approved an increase in numbers in Drumrah? Where were them pupils coming from? They were coming from schools in Oma. They were coming from schools in and around the Oma area. They weren't going to come from anywhere else. So what the member would have been coming to me up there and saying, Minister, why have you approved increased numbers at that school in Drumrah? Do you not realise them pupils are coming out of school A, B and C? What's going to happen in that school now? So the member and the members in this House can't have it both ways. But you have to make decisions on the information based in front of you, not just, basically, not just simply on the needs of an individual school, but on the needs of education in an area. That's what area planning is about, that we no longer make decisions about on the individual needs of one school, but on the needs of education in an area. Mr. McCann. I've got a uh, uh, question number uh, Cahar, question four. Uh, Going back to Slash and Valor and Kies. It's my intention to make a statement to this Assembly before the end of June 14, which will set out my plans for future capital investment in our schools across the North of Ireland. One of the biggest challenges that I face when considering proposals for such large scale capital investment in our schools is the need to balance the capital resources available to me with the investment needed across the estate. It is critical, therefore, that I ensure any major capital investment is shaped by the outworking of area plans and is targeted at ensuring the delivery of modern fit-for-purpose schools that will be sustainable into the future. Accordingly, my officials have been working to develop a protocol that will ensure potential capital projects are assessed and prioritised in a consistent and equitable manner. I can assure the House that I am mindful of the need for significant capital investment across the schools estate. My focus remains on the provision of a first-class educational experience for all our young people that will help them fulfil their potential. I can thank the Minister for his answer, but can the Minister give an update on the projects announced in his previous, previous capital lists in June 2012 and January 2013? Um, in, in June 2012, I announced 18 new build uh, school projects to proceed on uh, Four projects are currently on site, Victoria Park uh, in Belfast, St Teresa's in Lurgan, St Joseph's in Urie, Dromore Central Primary School. A further three projects targeted to be on site by the end of June 2014, Tonnockmore in Lurgan, Eglinton Primary School and Bunskull Ben Monaghan in Belfast. In addition, advanced enabling works have commenced on projects in St Clair's Abbey in Urie and Arville East Special School uh, in Oma. In January 2013, I announced a further 22 new school builds uh, to move forward. The majority of these projects are announced are in an early stage in planning, principally economic appraisal stage, and my officials are actively engaging with the relevant school authorities on these projects. I also understand uh, my officials are briefing the Education Committee either this week or next week in relation to the Capital Bills programme. Mr. McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his comprehensive answer. Of those announced in January of this year, uh, and I speak as chair of the, uh, the all-party group on construction as well. How many of those will the minister guarantee will be on site and commence construction work as soon as possible? And I mean within this year. Well, in fairness, the, the member realises that and when I made the announcement in January 2013, I said that these projects were in the early, early stage uh, of planning, and they have to move forward through that. Since I made my first announcement in June 2012, I have to say I've become an expert in everything from uh, bots, uh, hogweed, anything else that can delay a planning application or a building that we have encountered over this last two years. And I have no doubt we'll continue to encounter problems as we move forward with the further building works. But I can assure the member that every effort is being taken to move these projects forward as quickly as possible. Indeed, I have uh, restructured even branches within my own department. 
uh, to move the projects forward. We are tr trying our best to resource and finance uh, the SEL or the boards to move these matters forward as well. And there is a significant learning process going on about how you can move projects forward all the time. But there are certain elements I cannot avoid, and which I have said in this House before take far, far too long to complete, such as business cases and economic appraisals, which we have to complete because of uh, financial guidance and things that have been put in place by various committees of this House, which maybe were seen as a good idea at the time. But I can assure you, the more complicated and the more gold or red tape you have around a project, the longer it takes to deliver. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister mentioned uh, Arvalee uh, School in East Belfast. Can he confirm if that's a 14 classroom school as opposed to a 12? I think the member may mean Victoria School in, in East Belfast. Um, I have had recent correspondence from the Education Library Board, Belfast Education Library Board seeking to increase Victoria Primary School to a 14 base classroom. We are currently working through, again, the paperwork in regards to that matter, but I hope to be able to confirm uh, that that will be a 14 school base moving forward. Uh, there's a few I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed in relation to discussions with contractors, etc., but I, I don't see any major problems in the road of that. Stephen Agnew, Mr. Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And firstly, I declare an interest as Director of NICE. To ask the Minister, will priority be given to schools such as St. Colin Ballas College in Bangor, which are shovel ready products, projects that have been approved funding in the past until capital allowances were cut? Um, well, uh, there are a significant number of schools which were committed to bills in the past, which, and I have resisted the temptation to announce lengthy lists of schools that could move forward into the future. I've always said that I have only announced schools that I am confident can move forward within a reasonable period of time. And even in doing that, I have seen uh, delays to projects which were never envisaged in the first place. I am currently working my way through uh, a capital announcement. We have asked the various managing authorities for their priority list. I need to match that against area planning uh, and against uh, the, the needs and conditions of each of those buildings. But I have to say, members are following this. Question time will be discussing area planning. Those members who vote to stop area planning are actually and effectively voting for to bring a complete and utter end for the foreseeable future to any capital bills programme. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Question number five. Mr. Speaker, please. The South Eastern Education Library Board has advised that all children in the Hollywood, Bangor, and Donegal Dee areas, BT 18, 19, 20, and 21, whose parents engage fully with the preschool admissions process to the end, will have received the offer of a place following the end of Key Stage 2, which was on the 30th of May. In the Donegal Dee area, all children who applied were offered a preschool place in a setting of their choice at Stage 1 of the process. I understand that 17 children in the Hollywood area and 41 children in the Bangor area did not receive the offer of a place at the end of Stage 1, and that some 12 families decided not to submit further preferences at Stage 2. I have strongly encouraged the parents and guardians of children who did not receive the offer of a funded preschool place at the first stage of the process to consider the full range of preschool provision that remains available and provide a range of preferences at stage two to increase the chance of securing a place for their child. A number of funded places remain available in both areas, and parents are advised to engage directly with the providers. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister though, fully recognise the need for such board provision in, North Down, in the North Down area, uh, taking on board the increase in population and the demand, and of course to ensure equality of opportunity for, for parents and children, regardless of their background or their ability? Well, I, I recognise all of those matters. I also recognise that I am dealing with a programme for government commitment. And I, I hope the member recognises that over this last number of years, uh, preschool and the placement for preschool education has improved dramatically, and we have provided a significant number of additional places across the north. The information before me tells me that there is sufficient places in the Hollywood, Bangor and Donegal areas to facilitate current demand. However, it is up to the local uh, preschool education advisor group, working along with their education library board, uh, to request additional places if need be. If there are settings in the area that believe that they could and should facilitate uh, more children, then they are more than entitled to bring forward a development proposal. 
I'm conscious Kula, that this could be a constituency specific question. My question relates to uh, the allocation of preschool places and uh, I accept your reprimand if need be or I can go ahead and ask a question. No, I mean, I'm not going to prejudge what the member might, might ask, but it is the member's right. It's, it's a specific constituency question. So the member might be inclined to widen the question out. I think that's maybe what his plan is. And I would prefer he wouldn't. I well, would I'll prefer he your, wouldn't. I'll accept your advice yeah. on Because it's unfair to the order. minister as well. No matter. Pat Ramsey. Mr Ramsey. Question six, Mr Speaker. Uh, the entitlement framework is about broadening access to courses for all pupils in key stage four and post-16 courses that are relevant to young people, engaging and motivating for them, and with clear relevant progression pathways to continue in education or move into training or employment. In 2003, some of our young people could only choose from six GCSEs and, in worst cases, one A-level course. Schools are now working well towards the full implementation of the entitlement framework on a phased basis. It will be important for them to focus on meeting the full statutory requirements of 24 and 27 courses in September 15. Schools are funded through their core delegated budget to deliver the statutory obligations, including the curriculum. The additional entitlement framework funding has been a transitional arrangement, a contribution to the costs associated with developing an expanded curricular offer at key stages 4 and post 16. Although you will be aware that uh, I extended this additional funding to the end of this budget period, it has never been intended to be a permanent funding stream. Rather, the delivery of the entitlement framework will have been mainstreamed in schools and across area learning communities. I will, however, continue to explore funding in future years, if available. The legacy of the entitlement framework support will be the delivery of a broad and varied curriculum on an area basis, so that every child can follow the right pathway for him or her. It has helped us all to focus on what is important, meeting the needs of our young people and ensuring they are supported and equipped with the knowledge and understanding and skills necessary to drive the economic future uh, of us all. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his response, but the Minister along with me would acknowledge that many young person who has been struggling or couldn't cope with a normal school environment has taken advantage and obtained good qualifications in colleges as a result of this funding mechanism. Is he not concerned as part of the wider NEET strategy that this will have a further impact, a detrimental impact? on young people coming out of the system and becoming neat? Uh, it was never the, the funding for the entitlement framework was never there to subsidise the role of uh, the further and higher education sector. But I do accept that both work very well together and it has been a very good collaboration and indeed uh, I and Minister Farry have discussed it on several occasions and I have met representatives of the sector on several occasions to discuss how that has worked out. And indeed, I have brought uh, a Dale representative onto my area learning, uh, or sorry, area planning uh, steering group so that we can coordinate uh, much better in terms of facilities going into the future. Um, there has been some concerns expressed about the costs associated with working uh, with the colleges sector, and I think that's something that needs to be explored uh, further. And if those costs can be reduced or managed in a better way, then I think uh, it allows us to move forward uh, in a greater way. But the entitlement framework covers a, wide, covers a wide range of subjects. It has allowed many, many of our young people to flourish in different ways and to choose career paths that were worth, which once were not open to them. And I think it has certainly helped us uh, ensure that many, many more young people are leaving school with relevant qualifications and with a career pathway set out for them. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are no specific plans at present for a new build project for the high school in Balna Hinch. The high school has not been identified by the South Eastern Education and Library Board as one of its priorities for a new build, nor has any application been received under the recent calls for projects under the School Enhancement Programme. The draft SELB post primary area plan dated October 2013 states that the enrolment at the high school in Balna Hinch is below the sustainable schools policy threshold. SELB is currently considering options to secure retention of a controlled, non selective post primary school in Balna Hinch area. Questions to the Education Minister. 
We now move to topical questions. And call Danny Kinahan. Mr. Kinahan. Very much again, Mr. Speaker. And if I can return to the closure of Belie Community High School and ask the minister to say who made the decision and why was it made so that it happened in the middle of um, the election? I made the decision. Uh, I made the decision based on the information provided to me, both in terms of the development proposal, engagements, and discussions I had with interested parties and local elected representatives. And I've said this in the House a number of times, I believe, to Mr. Schwab. Uh, those who were supportive of the Lee High School were dedicated to the school. They were dedicated to the young people in the school. There's no question of that. My, my concern was, had they arrived on the scene in time to turn the situation around? And the enrolment at the school was in such a state. Uh, prospects for increasing that enrolment were practically zero. Uh, and I had serious concerns about the educational well-being, not only of current pupils at the school, but of future pupils at the school if I was to continue to, with that school open. And I decided, and I believe I made the right decision to close it. I had, was pressed on making a decision on the 20th, 21st of May in relation to because letters had to issue to parents by the 23rd of May, except it was not an ideal time uh, to make it. And if I had to do it again, I would maybe have made the decision much earlier. I would have made the decision after the election. But I did not announce this decision to the media on election day. Others announced it to the media on election day. The press release from the Department of Education did not go out until, I believe, the 23rd of May. And thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But can he guarantee that we're not going to have another orange field? And that what steps has he put in place to ensure that pupils all have places, that parents have choice, and that schools are prepared and ready for September 2015? Well, I, I'm not going to compare one school against another school, or whatever it may be. Uh, but the member will be aware my decision to uh, the closure of Belize Community High School on, from the 1st of October also aligned to the increase of the enrolment of Dunclog College as well. So there is provision being made in the area for pupils to move across to whichever schools they wish, but they have certainly increased uh, provision at least one school in the area. Uh, I want to see provision being planned, and this goes to the crux of the debate we are having uh, both before and after the, the question time debate. I want to see area planning at the heart of all these decisions. And often those decisions can be very difficult uh, and very emotive for everyone involved, but I believe the decision around Belize was the correct decision. It no way undermines those who campaigned for or worked in the school. They were clearly dedicated to the young people they served, but as I said to them at the meetings they had with them, and as I said to Mr Schwann uh, in, in this chamber, I had asked myself the question, had they arrived on the scene on time, and they hadn't. And that's just the sad thing about that. Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Could I ask the Minister uh, if he could outline how the current area planning process facilitates increased sharing between schools? Well, uh, and this goes back even to in terms of the entitlement framework. Uh, there's a number of factors at play in relation to sharing in our schools estate. Area learning communities have been working quietly away with each other for several years now in relation to sharing across the curriculum, and in many areas that has broadened. Uh, to the, the broader understanding of sharing between uh, the communities and sectors and, and better understanding of each other. In relation to area planning, in the very terms of reference of area planning, it refers to the need to increase sharing across sectors. And on each time I meet the sectors at the, the steering group, I emphasise to them the need to bring forward proposals in relation to shared education and for them to challenge each other and challenge communities where we can to think at times the impossible, uh, and take the next step towards sharing uh, in, in our local community. Right. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response. Could I ask the Minister, uh, sort of given recent events, could the Minister outline how, if at all, uh, the area planning process has been affected by the recent developments regarding ESA? Um, ideally, ESA should, or area planning should move, under, or move forward under a single planning organisation, that being ESA, with all representatives uh, of all the sectors around the table, it has to be said, uh, and representatives of all the major political parties uh, around the table as well. So it would be a very democratic and collective way 
uh, of moving the process forward. So I think the absence of ESA has hampered area planning, but it certainly isn't necessary to stop area planning because of it. We have to work around the, the, the obstacle of ha not having ESA in its place, but I believe that the structures we have put in place, and indeed I'm currently review reviewing the area steering group, and maybe breaking that down into uh, more localised uh, steering groups uh, to work in board areas rather than just a, an oversight committee. Uh, I'm taking a look at that, but I think the structures we have in place are fit for purpose. John Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Minister, the majority of primary schools out there are express, expressing serious concerns about the education and appropriateness of end of key stage assessments. What steps are being taken by you and your department to address these concerns? Um, well, the most significant step I have taken is, was bringing in the OECD. And we brought the OECD in to take a look at our assessment procedure. And their report has been very valuable in the ongoing discussions between my officials and representatives of the teachers' side in, in regards to these matters. Because the OECD points out that our assessment processes are robust, our assessment processes are necessary, but what we have failed to do is to convince uh, those who are using them, i.e. the teaching staff, of the merits of them, and we haven't up to now engaged with them properly in moving that forward. Over this last number of months, there has been detailed discussions between my officials, SIA, and the trade unions, and I hope to be in a position uh, very soon uh, to be able to announce, if there's agreement, obviously, uh, and uh, it all depends on agreement, that we have found a, for a way forward in relation to assessments, because I believe assessments are necessary, but we, uh, I'm not seeking to impose assessments upon the teaching profession. I'm looking to work with the teaching profession in relation to how we carry out assessments. Thank you for your answer, and I welcome the, the, the statement that you would work with teachers. But the reason that teachers are not happy with it is because it's not good assessment for learning. Would you consider um, suspending the present system until you can make a more informed decision about good assessment for learning? Well, in fairness, the OECD tell us that it is a good assessment for learning. But we have to adopt it. We have to work with those who are delivering it on the ground. So I'm not going to suspend it. I believe that our discussions with the unions are bearing fruit. And if we keep going uh, forward in uh, the method we're using, or in forward in terms of the discussions we're having with the trade union side, I'm confident we can reach agreement on the matter. Michael Coleman. Mr. Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister at what stage he intends to further brief the, brief the Assembly on the future administrative arrangements pertaining to education in Northern Ireland? Um, I'd be happy to brief the Assembly once uh, the paper I have submitted to the Executive uh, hopefully reaches agreement. Um, I, we are now at a critical stage where we're heading towards April 2015, which will see um, the alignment of the new 11 Council model. The boards are board. Uh, which is my preferred option moving forward, will have to be aligned to that model as well. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. He must surely be aware of the very deep concerns prevalent within the teaching fraternity as a result of our inability to foster consensus within education and create a fit-for-purpose education and skills authority. Expending on the project some of the reason of $17 million, which could have been spent on improving literacy and numeracy, can he outline what steps he will take to ensure that the creation of a single education and library board to replace the current five will avoid the uh, pitfalls, if that's the right word, what the concept fell into? Well, the old saying is that charity begins at home, and in this case, the consensus will have to begin at home. I would encourage the member to ensure that his party is in the mood to seek consensus around the paper, which will go before the executive, as he's aware he has a minister at the executive table. He will also be aware that one of the biggest opponents on manoeuvres, people who carried out many a manoeuvre against ESA, is the Ulster Unionist Party. Uh, so if there was £17 million wasted and over those last nine years, all the parties in the chamber will have to put up their hand, but those who put their hand up the highest will be the Ulster Unionist Party. Declan Magali. Uh, uh, can the Minister provide a progress update on the Home to School Transport Review? The review is is moving forward. It has had significant engagement with young people and the education sector. Uh, I hope to have their report by the end of August, I believe, and then we will move forward from there in regards to their recommendations. Mr. Uh, 
at Garbogat. Can the Minister outline how pupils with special educational needs will be protected moving forward? Um, uh, yes, I, I can assure that I'm not planning any changes uh, to the transport arrangements or the needs or denying transport to children with special educational needs. Uh, throughout our tenure and indeed in relation to my predecessor's tenure, we have ring fenced funding for special educational needs. I have no intentions of denying children with special educational needs transport either. Mr. Mr. I, I can't call your, uh, Minister, the Irish Media and Post Primary Advisory Group has cried out significant work uh, since last summer, uh, and that work certainly has to be commended. I wonder if you could update the House on the report that that group recently presented to yourself. Uh, the group presented me with a report in mid-April. Um, I'm currently studying the recommendations contained with that report, and then I will make a statement on the way forward from that. Can I welcome the focus that the Minister has brought uh, to this particular area, and certainly Irish Medium Post Primary uh, is an area that needs uh, urgent development. Uh, can I ask the Minister what plans there are to action the report? Well, to say, uh, we brought Helen O'Murrakey and her group together to take a look at how we do uh, promote and facilitate particularly Irish Medium Post Primary education, uh, and it was in particular in around the Derry area, the county Derry area. Uh, in, in that regard, though the lessons which she has brought forward in her recommendations I think will facilitate us in developing the Munskull uh, across the north. So it has been a, a valuable exercise, but as I say, um, I received the report in mid-April. I'm still studying the recommendations and hope to be able to make an announcement on the way forward. Given that we're, we're heading towards the summer recess, I suspect it will be early autumn before I make a full announcement. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, wonder could the Minister outline if he has any finance secured or ring fenced for the proposed new build of Devonish College in Fermanagh? Um, I, I noted somewhere uh, during the week that Mr. Elliott was telling a, an audience that I had no funding to move Devonish forward. He believed it would never happen. Uh, I, I made uh, the, the power of social media. Uh, I made an announcement in relation to Devonish in January 2013. It is part of the building programme moving forward. As I am developing my building programme, I am conscious of the announcements I have made, so therefore they are built into my budget moving forward. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for that. Could he tell us if there is any opportunity to actually separate the issue of progressing the, the Devonish project without being dependent on the merger of Batora and the Collegiate? Um, I'm, I'm I haven't got the full details in front of me in relation to the, the question the member asks, and I'm also reluctant to make comment on an ongoing development proposal in relation to Petora and Collegiate. Uh, standing here, I'm not aware of any co-joint between them, between the building programme and, and the other development proposal, but I clarify that uh, with the member in writing uh, after this debate. Judith Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, similar to the provisions that are made at primary school level, if there are um, twins or triplets um, trying to get into a school and they've got one place, um, is there a similar provision or a policy that the Department has um, for enrolment into secondary schools? Um, well, it depends on terms of the admissions criteria for the secondary school. I'm aware of one circumstances in a selective school uh, where one of the twins didn't get in because of the grading the, secondary or the selective school uh, was using. Uh, my suggestion there would be not to use selection and that would solve that problem. Uh, but uh, that is the only circumstances I am aware of where it has been raised as an issue with me in relation to twins or triplets uh, trying to access post-primary school. Um, thank Minister um, for his answer. Um, is, is there any um, you know, advice at this stage that can be given um, to schools who have already chosen to use the selection procedure and are in that situation? Uh, stop using selection. Michaela <laughs> Boy. Can I ask the Minister to uh, outline how many children received a preschool place in the school of their choice this year, Gormogat? Um, we are currently in around 23,500 children have received a preschool placement uh, this year. I thank the Minister. Can I ask the Minister to outline how those who did not receive a place in their school of choice this year will be accommodated? Gormogat. 
Um, I have asked my department officials for a breakdown. We're currently, there's currently around 34 children who have not received uh, a placement. Those are those families and children who stayed with the system through stage one and stage two. I've asked my department officials for a geographical breakdown uh, of the locations of those children as to the reasons as to why each child has not been placed. Uh, and on receipt of that information, I have further discussions with them as to how we move this matter forward. Order,